All right. Hi. I am a Saudi bioengineer, and I know what you're thinking. What in God's name is a Saudi Arabian standing here telling us to stop using oil? Well, I'll tell you this. The writing is on the wall, and the world will soon have to move away from my country's primary source of income. So we need to be ready for what comes next. If you can't beat them, join them. And 96% of the Saudi total economy is actually based on non-renewable resources. We all know that. Petroleum, of course. Precious metals, aluminum, chemicals. But let me ask you this. Do you know what's Saudi Arabia's second largest export? It's actually construction materials. And it only accounts for 1% of the total Saudi economy. So even if my country decides so even if my country decides to um, move to the second most profitable sector, which is construction materials, it won't be possible to make up for the remaining 95%, right? It's, not, it's just not possible. So if anything, actually, construction materials sales have actually dropped this year by 40%. So Saudi Arabia needs to transition away from fossil fuel and all non-renewable resources and that's why Saudi Arabia is actually working on di divers uh, diversifying their economy uh, as part of their vision of 2030. So today, I'm talking to you about the economic survival of my country and the ecological survival of the world by moving to producing the next generation green, renewable, bioplastic, PHA bioplastic. But first, let me ask you this. Do you know that in 2030, like probably half of life forms could actually go extinct if we don't do anything about the pollution problem of plastic? And not only that, we could actually have a completely fishless ocean. The thing is, unfortunately, the vast majority of waste is not floating like that. It's actually either sunk deep in the water column or even worse, buried in the sediment. So it's really hard to clean it out, really difficult. And you might know, you might not know how this all started. And it's funny enough, it started for a pretty noble reason. It started when John Hyatt, a scientist in 1869, invented the plastic that we know today to stop the murdering of elephants. This was so sweet, but here we are today, 150 years later, with a plastic industry that has already reached 800 billion, a quarter of which, by the way, is just packaging, and with a production speed of 80 uh, million metric tons a year, only 9% of that is actually being recycled, 12% is incinerated, and the remaining 69%, 79% is actually left unprocessed in landfills or just dumped in the oceans. So let me ask you this. What would you do if you genuinely care about the environment, but you need to speak to giant oil producers? What would you do if you knew that the vast majority, or let's say a big portion of their sales, is actually for the production of plastic? How can you ask them to sacrifice billions in dollars of annual revenue? Well, Saudi Arabia will tell you this as part of their Vision 2030. We must acclimate to international norms regarding sustainability, environmentally sound policy, and most importantly, the willingness to, chan to change and transition away from fossil fuel. And actually, by taking these measures, Saudi Arabia can get closer to achieving its stated goal of becoming the world's beacon of thought and technology. This will actually help Saudi Arabia reduce its carbon footprint, preserve its own marine lives, and most importantly, adhere to the G20 Circular Carbon Economy Program, which is also part of their uh, Vision 2030. So you might ask, what are the current projects in Saudi Arabia that are related to sustainable plastic? I'll tell you this story. As part of my uh, project in bioengineering, I reached out to a giant oil producer here in Saudi Arabia 
I mean, where else would you go in Saudi Arabia? And it turned out that they wanted to keep a hand in all future production of plastic. I mean, who wouldn't? It's an 800 billion size industry. Everyone would want part of that, right? And here's a fun science fact. Microorganisms in soil, such as uh, fungi, algae, bacteria, even worms, uh, produce enzymes that biodegrade things or break them down. The more you learn about these enzymes, the easier it gets for chemists to design their synthetic plastic. Pretty cool, huh? So I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm sure you're asking, did I hear this correctly synthetic plastic from crude oil that biodegrades just like that in normal environmental settings? Well, yes, I actually said that, but hold on a second. It's a, quite a challenge, so we're not there yet. We don't know. We actually need more research, more data, before industries flood the market with a new product, and we end up adding up to the problem, not solving it, just like what happened with compostable plastic. And it depends on which country you're from. Most likely, every time you go to a supermarket, you'd see a lot of these products labeled as compostable, and it makes you feel good about yourself saving the environment where the truth is, without a shadow of a doubt, you're actually hurting the environment. Guess why? Because these require a very special processing facility. Yes, there are only a handful of those in the US, let alone the rest of the world. And they require high temperature, high humidity, and a lot of other requirements. So. Even if you had waste segregation process in place, this could mess it up, if you had one. So let me ask you this. If conventional plastic is terrible and compostable plastic is just as bad, then what is the solution? Well, the world's solution, and it might be the only solution moving forward for a circular economy, is actually the renewable new generation, green bioplastic, PHA, polyhydroxyl conoates. It comes from the fermentation process. And it's the greatest solution, why? Because it's made by the world's best, smartest engineers, bacteria. And I'll tell you how you make it. There are more than 300 species of bacteria that are capable of reducing this type of bioplastic, PHA. And you only have to choose the carbon source you're gonna feed them. And remember, bacteria feed on pretty much anything. It could be carbon dioxide, believe it or not. It could be uh, sugar, uh, it could be industrial organic waste, it could be dairy products, everything you can think of. So once you pick your carbon source, let's say you choose sugar, then here's the trick. This is how you do it. You stress the cells out, you stress them so much you stop giving them nitrogen and other, eliminate nitrogen, eliminate other nutrients. And just like humans, when they're stressed out, they start accumulating, in this case, bioplastic. And this could reach actually up to 90% of their weight. Pretty cool, huh? The coolest thing about PHA, what I love about PHA the most, is actually it saves lives. It's 100% biocompatible, which means when it breaks down in the human body, it actually does not increase the acidity and in return increase or cause any inflammatory response. It doesn't do that, it's perfectly fine. Unlike PLA or polylactic acid, um, another bioplastic type in the market. So it's great. And that makes it um, a very attractive option for biomedical applications, such as um, cardiac valves, uh, sutures, drug delivery, um, um, tissue engineering, and so many other biomedical applications. It's also great for something else. Remember the 800 billion size industry of plastic where a quarter of that is in packaging? It's great for packaging because it's easily 3D printed, easily dyed, and it's a great UV light barrier. And because I was so in love with PHA and so excited about, about PHA by plastic as much as probably you are today, I launched my startup, Plastis. And Plastis is actually uh, produces 100% uh, biodegradable bio, uh, bioplastic, um, scalable, does not compete with food security, and it uses renewable resources as a carbon source. Plastis 
um, won uh, first place Spark Award last month by Monshaat, Niyam, and, and Mitsk. And uh, as part of Plastis, I invented Plasto, which is one model apparatus where you can have the entire process from start to end. So you start with a chamber. Uh, the first one is a bioreactor or like fermenter. And then you ferment your bacteria. And then you get there, it goes through the entire process till the end. There is a mold inside a, uh, an oven where you can literally get your plastic plate fresh out of the oven. Thank you. What I wanted to invent more than plastic itself, I wanted to invent a new culture of possibilities. I, env I envision a future where families and kids can go to these restaurants and industrial zones and enjoy the experience, learn more about the fermentation process and the renewable resources that you can get from it and make their own plastic plate literally fresh out of the oven in these places and learn, see it for themselves. What I love about plastic, uh, what about PHA um, by plastic in general is the end of life cost. They might tell you that conventional plastic costs like what, 70 cents upfront per pound, but it could cost three to four times more for the PHA by plastic. But they don't tell you about the end of life cost, what they threw at the consumer. What about um, re recycling programs for the conventional plastic? That could cost up to $150 per ton. What about trash disposal and collection programs? That could also co uh, cost up to $200 per ton. So they just decide to throw this at the consumer. Also, another great news is with PHA, with the current science that we have in place today, we can actually reduce the cost upfront of the PHA because the coolest project I've seen by far this year was an actual PHA uh, factory that was built as an add-on to an existing weight, waste processing plant. So they saved on the cost, right? But here's the coolest thing that I've seen. They actually used methane gas to feed the bacteria. And they picked methanogen bacteria. So imagine this. Methanogen bacteria feed on methane gas and then produce our bioplastic PHA isn't that the perfect circular economy that Saudi Arabia wants? I'll tell you something cooler than that. There's something called Next Generation Industrial Biotechnology, NGIB. And it's great because every engineer um, knows um, how that Holomonas species specifically are, have the ability to uh, generate or become a contamination resistant. Because remember, half of the cost is actually on the carbon source. You can save well, you, you can save on that. We discussed that. But the other half is actually either on the extraction process or the purification process. So with NGIB, you can save on the purification process if you start with a contamination resistant strain of bacteria, because you don't have to spend a lot on purifying your product. It's already uh, purified. So this is really cool science there that we can use to reduce the cost. Before I close my remarks, this is the one of the things that really important to discuss is, and great too, great news, uh, bioplastic market in general was only 2% of the total plastic industry in 2015, and that was valued at $6 billion. That actually grew to 5% in 2015. And that was valued at $30 billion. And this could grow even to 40% or even 50%, depending on government regulations, in 2030, and this could translate into something between 300 billion to 400 billion. And you know what that means? That means if Saudi Arabia have the first in market advantage and, and invest in more expertise and more in this uh, sector, then we could capture, pretty much capture 20% of this market, and this could translate into $80 billion. And that's close enough to 10% of the total export Saudi economy. And this is huge. So to close my remarks, I just wanted to say that polyhydroxyalkanoate is the smartest renewable investment that Saudi Arabia could make to generate up to 10% of its total export economy. We need more expertise and skills in this field to learn more about the renewable resources from the fermentation process of bacteria because bacteria is the, are the world's smartest engineers and we need to make friends with them 
to save the environment and diversify our economy. Thank you.